<laughs> Welcome to the, uh, the State of Live production, and it's good to see everybody live yet again uh, after so many, uh, so many months not live. Um, so let's start off with the introductions, and we're, I'm gonna, easy way to do this, I'm just gonna have everybody introduce themselves. So let's start for, off first with Randall. Okay, I'm Randall Hurst, CEO and founder of Vista Studios. Sounds good. Dan, Dan Howes, uh, VP of Encoding and Digital Strategy, BC Live Productions. George Klippel, Director of Channel Sales for Live View. Awesome sauce. So we've got uh, a wide breadth of experience here, and we're going to be getting into uh, some hopefully not too difficult questions. Um, so let, what we're going to do is we're going to start with George and work this way for the first round. Um, so tell us a little about about your company or department, and how you are approaching a video strategy with live production in today's new day and age. Yeah, so LiveView was founded in 2006. We're the industry leader in bonded cellular or IP cellular connectivity. Uh, what we do is we really solve uh, customers' problems where they're having connectivity issues on the field. We replace satellite systems. Uh, we help people connect. Um, using bonded cellular. Um, so we're taking multiple modems in our units like T-Mobile, uh, Verizon, AT&T, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, bonding those together, making a big pet fat pipe to the internet, and getting your video from point A to point B, whether that's to a cloud infrastructure or an on-prem infrastructure and doing Remy productions. Um, and essentially, that's what our company does, and we've been doing it for over 15 years. We started in the broadcast side of the space, and um, that's where we got our kind of foothold. We have about 65% of the market um, globally in that world. And every network uses LiveView, has a LiveView decoder. Um, but more and more, we're seeing production companies like these here on the stage um, and others, not only production companies, but corporate Fortune 100 companies um, and others using our technology day in and day out, including sports. Um, and uh, education institutions using our technology to comp, you know, to do day-to-day -day, uh, type of um, work and to, to stream reliable um, um, video back from the field to destinations that they want to uh, get to around the globe. So essentially, that's what we do as, a, as an organization. Awesome, thanks, George. Dan? Yeah. How are you approaching a video strategy with live production in today's day and age? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we're based out of here in Burbank, California, uh, BC Live Productions. We're a boutique video uh, production company. Um, and, you know, we've obviously always had live video um, and a strategy for that. But now it is, you know, the producers we're finding know enough to be dangerous, right? And with this COVID period, being ready for all of those expectations that come our way on a live show, right? Uh, if it's from, you know, Zoom and Teams and, oh, let's just bring somebody in, you know, on their on their phone uh, to a more robust solution. You know, it is, I, I like to say, uh, we try to be ubiquitous, but robust, right? So we, we don't want the quality of our shows to go down, but we want to make them as accessible as possible, not only with talent necessarily in the show, but but more and more, um, uh, and sometimes most more challenging than others, is the producers and everybody else backstage that would have normally been on a set um, or that is making key decisions. Those folks know that they don't have to leave their homes anymore, and they expect to have a good experience from their side viewing into our production, whether that be on site or if it's completely in the cloud. So a lot of that is, um, we spend a lot of time doing that, is making sure that everyone on the production has a good experience, whether it's talent, producers, that sort of thing. And we're focusing a lot of that um, in our efforts this year. And BC Live is not only a Kiko client, but they've saved our bacon with a couple other clients of ours. So big thanks to you. Um, I'll give you that 20 bucks later. Okay, thanks for great. that. Uh, Randall, uh, what, do you, what do you see as uh, the, the new strategy? Well, uh, Vista Studios was founded about six years ago. We've been in operation for about five. Uh, I took a look at the landscape of the marketplace and said, you know, there's a niche there that isn't being serviced. Mission critical live productions are going to be increasing in volume. The linear networks are selling off their brick and mortar capabilities. And you have new players coming into the marketplace, big streamers that don't have either the brick and mortar, nor do they have the technical staffs to do the kind of mission critical live productions that I come from in my career. So we took over a 30,000 square foot building in Vista, in Fly Vista, California, and built it out for mission critical live. 
generator ATS, UPS, 4K, 2K, 1080i, and everything in between in any format and any frame rate. And the idea was we were going to be able to do turnkey productions for clients walking in the door. And when you look at something that's happened over the last couple of years with COVID, you know, people are working remotely, you're doing Remy productions, uh, production offices are being scaled back and you're getting uh, smaller footprints in, in production companies and remote edits. They're not doing uh, as many edit bays in the, in the office anymore. We built a facility that can support all of that. So our strategy has been do the most difficult kind of production out there, do it turnkey. And when COVID came along, we happened to have a solution that allowed Remy capabilities, it allowed remote edits, and, and it put us in a good position to survive and flourish during a really challenging period. So our attitude is offer turnkey services at the very highest level and get it, have it ready for live mission critical and you can do that in anything of a lesser standard near live or as live. So uh, that's what we built it to do and fortunately in, in when COVID hit, we were adaptable and, and ready to make the changes that had to be made over the last couple of years. So that's been our approach. Awesome, thanks. So um, next question, and we're gonna start with Dan on this one. Um, tell us about a recent technical project you've worked on and what made it really cool and unique. Yeah, um, there's this company that's pretty cool. They're called LiveView <clears throat> and... Uh, oh, oh my uh, let God. Me get, let me give my $20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we actually did a, a, we've been done a bunch of fun projects here with George, but one of them uh, most recently was for the Molokai Hoi. And if any of you are fans of paddlers, Right in Hawaii, they do this paddle race uh, between the islands, and it's been going for what 60 years or something. There's a really cool case study on their website uh, if you want to go check it out. But we were technical partners for o Ocean Paddler TV, and basically they had uh, dinghy boats out in the ocean following these paddlers for how many miles is it? It's like 20 something like that. Yeah, yeah. the outrigger race. Yeah, the outrigger it's huge. race. Huge. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy to watch those guys work, but they had dinghy boats, you know, out in the middle of the ocean and we had to bring everything back uh, over bonded cellular to uh, the control room, which is literally in the middle of the island and then broadcast that out to local television to you know, um, all the different destinations that they may want to go to. And so it was a pretty cool project to work with these guys on to see that technology work, to see it. You know, the biggest thing is, is that when you know, a signal may drop out or something like that, which is bound to happen when you're out in the middle of the ocean. How quickly does it recover? Is it in sync? You know, does that decoder actually do its job and make everything still in sync so we can cut a perfect show? And it was awesome to work with LiveView on that uh, to make those things happen. So we had a lot of fun on that. Yeah, and just to add to that too, because I think Randall, right? I, I, Randall mentioned this too about Remy production because BC Live's been doing Remy and we've been doing Remy for years. I've been with LiveView for six years and, you know, Remy start, started off in sports really. That's where it got it, its niche. But, you know, that, that race was one of the last things we did before COVID hit. And Remy skyrocketed after the COVID uh pandemic and rightfully so because everybody moved into their homes and started setting up insert studios and doing these remote production type of uh, events and in this particular case you know we're out in the middle of the ocean we're sending feeds back we're using extenders we're using at the finish line in oahu uh, they had thousands of people there right and they're all streaming and wanting to stream and bandwidth is finite when you're dealing with uh, any type of production with bonded cellular right and it just gets sucked down to eventually zero and, you know, having the ability to work with uh, quality equipment and productions where you're sending a signal back to a server and it's getting, you know, it could be miles away, it could be in a next country, it's irrelevant where it is when you're doing a Remy production. But really, from our standpoint, over the last three years, we've seen Remy just skyrocket, just blow right off the charts. Uh, and people who used to be taking fly packs and building up big fly packs and sending out trucks everywhere, they've, sa they've realized there's monetary savings here. And and real, you know, logistical savings, money, money, everything else, right? Um, because you're moving to this type of workflow and, and you're able to uh, save and use your existing infrastructure and facilities like Randall's to, to um, um, do these types of productions, really. So it was a big savings, not only for this one um, instance, but for us at LiveView, we've just seen it, you know, skyrocket from a production standpoint. Awesome. So, I mean, that... That takes care of both of you. 
one project, two, two stones is perfect. <laughs> Randall, how about you? Cool, unique project. Only one? Uh, you know what, you can have two. If, if he you does want. two, I want to do two, no, we, uh, if we got uh, time. Oh, man. I that is, is <laughs> the challenge that we've had during COVID is we've had a, a bunch of different curveballs. So uh, just to highlight a couple of things, we did, a, we did an 11 camera 4K production for YouTube, Google, Tiny Food, uh, a bunch of POV cameras in 4K, uh, a bunch of kids running around and stuff. So it was a, a fun uh, production. Um, and it kind of uh, stresses what we do and shows showcases 4K capabilities natively and, um, you know, a lot of high turnover and a high, high volume. So that was one of the most interesting things we did recently. It was high camera count and, uh, and it was an interesting project. Which which makes me ask, if it's tiny food, why do you need to see it in 4K? Uh, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> we asked the question. Too, right? <laughs> yeah. Whatever they want. You know what? Hey, we'll, whatever you want. We'll, we'll make it happen. Um, so, uh, George, do you have, do you have one, another one, or do you want to stick with uh, the paddling? Because that, that, that is a pretty cool project. Yeah, no, you know, we did one previously to that that was uh, pretty cool with the Ocean Cleanup Project. I don't know if you remember that one, but that was part of one we did together with Key Code Media, where um, in San Francisco uh, Bay, they were taking out uh, this big rig out into the middle of the ocean to uh, uh, collect all the debris in the... Um, I forget what it was called, the, the big garbage patch out mm -hmm. there where there's this circular uh, continuum that just somehow grabs all the crap out in the ocean and uh, the plastics and everything else. And it just, so, so for some reason, it keeps circling around and around. And this, uh, this uh, entrepreneur from Sweden, I believe, um, uh, came up with this technology to go out and kind of collect it out there and, and bring it back in. And we did this uh, Remy shoot where we had drones and everything else. And we were on the Air Force Base, I believe, where Key Code uh, was switching it. Um, and, uh, you know, we had multiple cameras, again, doing uh, just another Remy production. And I think it was just, again, another way of uh, showcasing that technology, using it with multiple cameras, which was really good. But I, I will say that, um, now we're seeing, and this just ties into the post NAB name of this thing, um, you know, at NAB this year, everything before, and even in this case where we did this event with BC Live and that event with you, you know, it's on-prem servers, right? We were using on-prem servers, and now we're moving a lot of this to the cloud where, you know, um, before we're having SDI out and NDI out and RTMP coming out of a physical server, and a big move and a big push that you're seeing at NAB was a lot of people talking about cloud infrastructure. And for LiveView, um, that means for us now our cloud uh, servers that used to just do RTMP, now we're doing MPEG TS, now we're doing SRT, now we're doing NDI out of the cloud. So I think that's gonna change a lot of dynamics uh, for people like Randall and I think other companies too that want that cloud infrastructure uh, because some companies and organizations, uh, especially for us when we're working with federal government or in uh, very secure uh, organizations, and you know, I'm not from Hollywood like you all are uh, probably, uh, but I'm assuming the studios out here just don't like slapping in a server and open up ports, right? They probably don't dig that. Uh, so cloud infrastructure is much easier to get in and, and uh, to allow that uh, to happen. So. Um, I think that's uh, a big thing that you'll see coming down the, the, the road. Maybe I skipped a little bit ahead on questions. No, Sorry no, that's, about that's that. That's perfectly but. fine because that, that, <laughs> that gets me in. That's a perfect segue into the next question about um, upgrading equipment. And uh, cloud lives in that space, too. So, um, Randall, let's start with you on this one. Um, how, you know, have you gone about upgrading equipment over the recent few years? What, how has that changed from how you did upgrades in the past? For, for us, we needed the flexibility of when anyone walks in the door, if they're going to be working 4K, 2K, it doesn't matter to us. So the kinds of things that we expanded on, we expanded our core routing capabilities, we expanded our core communications matrix. Um, so those were the basic kind of pathways of connectivity that, that allowed us to do what we needed to do with Remy's and high 4K count shows. So that's what we did specifically during uh, uh, COVID. And, because we had an opportunity to kind of get our manufacturer's attention when things were slow, we were able to get, you know, uh, really good lead times on things, get it deployed, get it properly configured without, you know, a, a lot of elaborate lead time. So that's what we did. We focused on our core competency. And in the middle of COVID, we did a couple of things. We, we doubled the size of our company. So we took a second building and then we fibered together the two buildings. So now we started with 
28,000 square feet. Now we have 50. We started with four stages. Now we have six. So it was sort of a setting the foundation kind of a thing for us to do. Doubling down, that's always a, an interesting strategy. Um, and I've yet to hear that fail for, for folks that doubled down during COVID. So just one interesting thing I've heard in, in we did one of these already in, in Seattle and that, this one today and people who doubled down got double profits. So it's, it's a good thing there. Um, Dan, uh, upgrades. Yeah, I think uh, for us, uh, um, an upgrade of mindset was interesting. You know, we've always uh, done a lot of live production on set, um, uh, you know, going out. Uh, but we decided to partner as soon as COVID happened, we decided to partner with the switch and we built out uh, several control rooms around Los Angeles. And one is at the switch's location on, on Motor Avenue um, and allowed us to basically have a lot of ins and outs out of their routers, um, taking advantage of their fiber and their AWS direct connect, uh, which was great. Um, and it allowed us to, I think, the upgrade mindset of accessibility uh, and platforms, right? Offering more to our clients that would come in the door and say, if you want to do multiple audio translations or captioning, that's sort of a passion of mine. I have a family member that's deaf, hard of hearing, and I've always really been into captioning and really been into audio translations and how to provide the best user experience. So we spent a lot of time working with partners and upgrading our partnerships uh, for distribution. Um, that was a, a it's it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot a lot of challenges, right? Um, but very rewarding. Awesome. So that question really doesn't apply to you, George. So let's go with, what do you see the big challenges for the industry right now? Wow, um, I thought it did apply to me, but I'll go with the challenges the industry. Um, really, I think it's just keeping up with technology. Um, there's so many changes, so many things that are happening. Um, you know. And, and there's so many different workflows that are available out there. I think that's one of the biggest challenges to the industry on, on people coming up even today at this at the tables here asking, you know, what do you do? How does this integrate with this? How does it work with SNS? How does it work with Avid? How does it work with Grass Valley Amp? Um, you know, there's so many people that want to ask that question. And, you know, Randall already mentioned it about his facility working with so many different things. And I think BC Live, you guys are in the same boat. People come to us and it's not just they want to know about Live View. They want to know about how Live View integrates with all these other pieces of tech. And I think that's a big, uh, big challenge. And for us, you know, I started with LiveView six years ago and it, it used to be just an encoder decoder solution. And now we have all of these other products and Cloud Connect and all of these other things to make it easier for a customer who is using Grass Valley Amp or VizRT Vector or whatever, that we can integrate with those pieces and the, these tools because um, it is about workflow. It is about other tools that you're using. Um, it's not just about, okay, we're only live you and we can only work in our little sandbox, right? We showed uh, ingest at uh, NAB, for example, and, uh, you know, live you ingest integrates seamlessly with Avid iNews and works in that world now. So for those broadcasters that use iNews, we have a seamless solution that works with that today. And then we'll eventually have EMPS integration. So, I mean, th that's what the story people want to hear. But those are those problems that I think people are trying to solve when they talk to different manufacturers. At least that's what that's what we're hearing. Integrated solutions. Right. That, yeah. Keep keeping people ahead of technology. I, I've heard that logo somewhere before. Um, so, uh, Dan, let's go with you on this one. Yeah. Um, what are the main production challenges you're facing today? What have you been doing to overcome them? And what would be a single piece of technology that would make your work life simpler? Let me answer the two questions. All right. So I think uh, this, is, this may... Uh, this is maybe a sensitive topic, but I think um, we worked with uh, Oprah and Prince Harry on a project called The Me You Can't See, and it was on Apple TV+. Plus. Uh, we were with them for about six months, um, doing a lot of, a lot of, right in that height of COVID, uh, completely remote controlled, right? Sony Venice cameras that could not be operated by a person, had to be all remote controlled. You know, 70 to 80 producers and executives and all this kind of stuff needing to have secure access in and out of a production. Um, and one of the things that they talked about in that series over and over was mental health. And I think that, you know, when COVID happened in March 2020, 
probably most of us in this room were like, let's go, let's go. This is, you know, we're going to help and let's, let's revamp and retool. And what are we going to do? And a lot of us have been sort of on this high, if you will. And this past summer, for me, it finally started to slow down a little bit. And it was like, now then it kind of hit me, you know, and it started to hit some of our employees once we kind of got over this high. And so we've really been looking back on some of those lessons learned actually with that show, interestingly enough, and saying, how do we apply this to our company? How do we make sure that we're giving people time off? How do we address turnover? All those kind of things. Um, and I think it's, I think it's super important. Um, now the fun question, what, ask me again, so I don't get it wrong. Main production challenges or, or the piece of technology? Oh, the piece of technology? That would make your work, work life easier. That does make my work life easier? No, that would. Well, that would. Oh, my. I'd have to think on that. But I'll, I'll tell you what, my favorite piece of technology that I purchased, thanks to you guys that helped us source all kinds of stuff through COVID, and it's not Dante related. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we're all still waiting on those audio consoles, aren't we? Yamaha, come on. Uh, but the Terranex AV from Blackmagic, I'll tell you that thing, and I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a nerd because I'm into encoding and I'm into trying to transmission at the end of the chain, but that thing has saved my life time and time again. It can have delays on it. It can change your frame rate, your resolution. Uh, today, this morning, we had to do a thing with uh, Chef Jose Andreas, World Kitchen, and I literally just raced over here to get here, and he was in the Ukraine. They're feeding all these people. His video came in upside down. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He goes, don't give me shit. Uh, I'm on the middle of Ukraine. Come on. His video was literally upside down in his camera and something was locked, you know, sometimes on the iPhone where it won't turn. So, you know, the Terranex AV, baby, it just helped me kind of turn that image around and we put him on the air. Um, so it, it's, it's a, a great thing, product. It's the little things that bring us joy. In this business. <laughs> I, I it love is. it. Uh, Randall, how about you? Uh, what's the, what's the, first part of the first part of the question is uh, what's my password because I <laughs> fell asleep. I mean, the challenge of the moment. Then? The, the, the challenge of the moment. Um, pro main production challenges you're facing today. What have you been doing to overcome them? And what would be a piece of technology that would make your work life simpler? Uh, the challenges of today. Um, what's happened during COVID is you're you're hitting a lot of singles. You're getting a lot of ad hoc, one off kinds of things. For us, that's why the infrastructure of our facility has helped us a lot. It's adaptable and it's already been pre-configured. So what we're finding right now is you're, you're getting a lot of little one-offs. And before COVID, we would have people coming in saying, hey, we want to block out a stage for two years. And now what we're getting is, hey, we want to block off a stage for two weeks. So um, the biggest challenge of the moment is the transactional nature of what we're dealing with on a recurring basis, which are a lot of little lightweight ones. So you're getting a lot more turnover than you saw before COVID, uh, it hasn't settled back out to long-term commitments, long-term engagements, um, and we expect that that's you know uh, going to be coming. Uh, the, and what would make my life easier? It isn't technology; it's just m more human help. I mean, we, we have to track so many moving parts. Uh, if you come to shoot, we've got add this, subtract that, bring this in, change that. So. It's just when you're doing a lot of these transactional things because of the way the environment is right now, you need more high-end quality labor to, to make sure that it, you know, everything's getting done. So right now, it's, I don't need a, any technology. I just need really uh, competent uh, engineering firemen that are committed. You know, that's what we need more of. So if you got your resume. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, the thing is, labor supply chain is a real, real problem. Um, I'll, everybody's facing that in all, all manners of, of business. And, you know, we, we see it from McDonald's all the way up to, you know, to, to everybody. George, what do you think? Um, what are the main production challenges you're seeing today? And what would be a cool piece of technology that you'd love to see out there that would make your work life easier? Um, well, the main production challenges, I guess... You know, I, I'd echo everything these guys would say on the production side, especially what you were saying about mental health and people getting back together because, you know, everybody was hit hard, right? Um, and I, again, I talked a little bit about the workflow piece and that tie-in. So, and with, you know, from live use standpoint, I started, you know, six years ago and we were just the encoders and decoders and we've been continuing to develop production tools and now we have Tally and, 
you know, PTC camera control, remote uh, audio connect, Dante uh, integration. So I'm lucky to work for a company that keeps building on innovation and keeps connecting and interconnecting with different partners. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that that will continue and I believe that it will continue for us. So I don't have the same experience as these two gentlemen have in, in that regard. But, um, you know, if I could uh, think of one piece of technology um, that would make my life easier, it would be a robot um, to help me with what I have to do every day, day in and day out with my partners and uh, the customers I work with. I need that type of technology. Um, any questions for our panel from our audience today? I wonder about the boats and the bottom of the signal. Were you guys transmitting from that? Like, how far did the cell signal get out? You guys were, were broadcasting the stuff live, right? So, were the yep. boats and transmitters in? Yeah, yeah. So we used, uh, uh, LiveView has this cool technology called an extender mm -hmm. that has um, six additional modems in it plus high frequency gain antennas that you can connect either uh, via ubiquity or wirelessly or via Ethernet. So it gives you the ability to go off, you know, offshore or in, in different areas uh, with with a lot of people, crowded people like at a, like a Super Bowl or a, an event. Uh, but it pretty much uh, we were at at the furthest distance. I think we were about five miles off the shore at the at the furthest yeah. uh, distance out. But when you're in the in the ocean, we've done done things with the Navy and the Coast Guard and that where, where you lose signal as soon as you go over the horizon. I and mean, it's irrelevant where you're, what you're using unless you start using BGAN or satellite. Uh, but but with bonded cellular in any shape or form, or even with an extender, once you go over the horizon, you're out of luck. And that particular uh, gig was fun. We had the luck of having a really solid Verizon infrastructure because of the military on the island, right? So they've really built it up to make sure that all of those shores are covered. So. Uh, you know, and part of that is mapping ahead of time, right? And literally, you know, building into the budget to take those dinghy boats out and to see where our challenge is going to be. You know, it's kind of old school, but it's the best way to do that is do your testing. And we did have a helicopter coverage too, right? So you had helicopter coverage that was cut away. If you got, you know, if the boats were out of coverage range, you had a helicopter cut away. And so, you you know, there was a bunch of different, uh, you know, cutaway angles that you could go to or they could go to at any time. Planning ahead. Any other questions? Any other things you guys want to hit on for uh, live production? I mean, there's one other question I can ask. It's the fun one. You wasn't on your list. Uh oh. Where do you think we're going to be in 2025? <laughs> Dan, let's start with you because you got that look. <laughs> I hope that I'm on a catamaran drinking some bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the, the industry is going to be in 2025? Uh, Far away from your catamaran drinking the yeah, bourbon. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, being, being the youngest on the panel up here, I feel like I, I don't have the experience to answer that. I mean, it's, it is, it's amazing to see how much technology has changed even in the last two and a half years, right? Um, so I, again, I think it goes a lot back to now, um, putting stock and effort into our staff and, and treating and, and knowing that people know that they have the option to, you know what, I don't really want to live in California anymore. I'd love to still work for you, but I really just want to go back to Arkansas. Yeah. I was going to say Canton, Ohio, which is where I'm from, you know, <laughs> that's good too. pro football hall of famers, you know? Um, but I mean, I've been thinking about, about that in my head. It's like, do I really want to live in the rat race five years from now, I guess? And it, what is the feasibility of me just being able to move to Mexico and, you know, and do a Remy show or something? So it'll be really interesting to see where those things are. Don't have a great answer. Sorry. George, how about you? We're five years. Yeah, I think in, in that amount of time, 5G is going to be everywhere for sure. If not something else better, I think Starlink hopefully will be deployed and out. Um, everywhere. I think Remy's not going to be something new and exciting to anybody anymore. I think it's just going to be par for the course for almost every type of production because of the money and cost savings. And I think everybody's going to be doing it. Um, I think there's going to be other technologies that we haven't even thought of yet that'll be out there, of course. And I'm, I'm with Dan. I just, you know, I, I don't have that you know, if Dan Pisarski, our VP of engineering here, he'd have a much better answer than I, I would. But um, 
you know, technology is just developing so fast. Again, we have a four channel output unit now uh, or input unit now, and uh, I never thought that was gonna happen. So there's, there's just so many things that uh, uh, I can imagine that would come down the pipe, but um, I just think everybody's gonna be connected everywhere. I don't, you know, and, and bonded 5G, everybody talks about 5G is, you know, gonna replace bonding, but you still need bonding. And I think bonded cellular is here to stay and the, the the, the amount of money people have spent on sat trucks has just continued to decline, and I think it's just going to keep declining and it's just going to go in Migration of the tools, that's what I'm yeah. hearing. Migration of tools. Randall, what do you think, five years from now? You know, uh, when, you, when you bring a new business to the marketplace and you develop a business plan and you go out and raise money to stand something up, you have to kind of look at the landscape and see what's happening. So when I look at the landscape of what's happening, the indications that came from Netflix in the last few weeks give me an indication of what's happening for the next five years. So I built a facility that was geared towards the streamers. When were the streamers going to begin producing the kind of shoulder programming that I'm used to coming from the linear network world? I came from local affiliates, I was at Metro Media in 1985. I was at Fox when it was created. Uh, I was at the station group, I was at network. So what we always had was early fringe, five to eight. You had the talk shows, entertainment shows, sitcoms, your news. And that was the pipeline that funneled viewers into the big prime program. I think the lesson that Netflix learned a few weeks ago is you don't share passwords. You don't put all your content out at one time. And you don't ignore day of air, topical based programming. That's the gateway that brings people to the party. You can't ignore sports. You can't ignore day of air. So what do I see in five years? I see the streamers taking the playbook of the old linear networks and beginning to treat their platforms more like what we've seen that has worked for years. Those shoulder programs are the promotional elements that bring you to the big, high value video on demand assets. And I think five years from now, we're gonna see consolidation and the streamers are gonna be almost indistinguishable from what we grew up as the, the old network model. So I think that's what's coming. Uh, and, and I think to, to add to that, I, I've believe we're going to start to see aggregation. So just like we've we paid cable TV providers for years to do all of this aggregation of content and channels, I think we'll see the same thing happening with the streaming services. I will have, you know, stream stream platform number one, and it will have all these other channels inside of it. So it'll have... The, the key will be, the, the, the demise of Netflix is, you know, radically overstated because 225, 230 million viewers that's enough aggregated viewership that they can be a rallying point for other people's content. So they're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. It supports what you're saying. There's going to be much, much more of that. And the viewership will drive the mergers and acquisitions. And the, the other fun thing is we, we, you know, being in the technology business, we're always trying to look ahead and see where, where those changes are going to come. And one of those places you can see it is people's hiring patterns. Mm -hmm. So there are streamers that are looking to hire people in the linear content, day of air, sports, those those well, things are coming. Amazon Thursday Night Football, that deal is done. And you'll probably be hearing about in the next two to four weeks that Apple is securing NFL Sunday ticket for $2.5 a year. And the NFL, one of the most savvy media negotiating entities in the history of media, they now will be in business with Amazon, Apple, and the remaining powerhouse linear networks so, you know, they're telling you what's, what's happening. They're choreographing it, and we're going to be following along as companies and entities that support that execution. So, so you've had a look around the corner to see where the traffic is. So now, <laughs> now you're going to know. Well, where's Apple going to do NFL Sunday ticket? Where's, where are these things going to be hosted? Hopefully in facilities and in situations where people who've done it before can bring their expertise to bear. Hopefully. Exactly. Or our friends at Apple may be looking to do acquisitions. I mean, it, that's the, the piece we never never can tell. Plus, the you know the other fun thing is you know I just read an article today that all of ABC's uh, 
O&O origination is now done out of Woodlands, Texas. Doesn't matter if it's KABC, WABC, it's done out of Woodland, Texas. All of network is done there. It's no accident that CBS Viacom sold uh, TV City and the Radford lot for a total of $2.5 billion. The brick and mortar goes away, they get into an OPEX model, and, and the cash goes to drive content creation. They, they, you know, they, they know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're savvy. They've been around for a while. Any loss? I have a question. So speaking of, of five years ahead and the automation and the need for workforce, so speaking of live production, has anybody worked with or is there is anybody aware of any software that is being developed on the AI side or the algorithm side that would automate the live production editing? Well, there's been a number of things that have been out there. I remember there being uh, an assistant editor plug-in that would work for Final Cut once upon a time. Um, I think we will get to that point. I mean, there are live production systems that can do their own switching based upon their understanding of, say, a particular sport. So if it's basketball, they know this is happening, you go there, zoom into the ball, that sort of thing. Um, it, that sort of piece is not that difficult. I don't think you're going to get the finesse that you're going to get from a human creative at this point in time. Um, you may be able to get a rough idea of story. And the other thing I've seen is, you know, people being able to, you feed a script and you feed it time codes and you, you get a, a rough build and you just go in and polish. I, I wonder what the, what the AI algorithm would do about network nodes. You know. <laughs> Throw up all over itself. Yeah. <laughs> how, how are you going to incorporate that? Did that computer just flip me off? I <laughs> yeah. don't understand that. I, I think you, you bring up a great point. Rough cut, probably, uh, there's, a, there's going to be a way to get it close. You know, uh, I think that would, would, would reduce sub-mastering costs, but, but the, the, the finesse, because it's so, so much feel. Uh, you're looking and, at the, content, the volume of content is increasing, right? Everybody wants to be something. Everybody wants to upload something somewhere, but it's in such a rough state because everybody is using their phone, well, et cetera, et cetera. So if there's an AI software or algorithm that would stream that for users, that would be some piece of the that, that gets into asset management, and if it's in the cloud, there are a lot of things that can be done. This used to be, uh, when I was in, in, on the production side, it used to be something I used to talk about a lot. I can do anything you want provided you're willing to pay for it. Yeah, no, That's not going to be free. And I think, I think too, and the, the lead is going to come from sports, in, in my opinion, uh, because there's already AI solutions that can cut, be, just from a live feed, that can cut between plays and just do basic cuts only uh, between plays, and, and that's already out there now. Recap right? engines. Yeah. I don't, I don't think we can overstate what has happened during the pandemic which was for years, all the production houses brought in posts into their own officing. It was another revenue opportunity for them. And now that you're doing virtualization of editing and editing remotely, you've unlocked the production companies from being tied to a physical real estate footprint. And that means editors can be working on the other side of the world, the other side of the country, and the content can still be safe and secure behind a firewall. So. I think that's going to alleviate a lot of the bottleneck that, that may have existed for this accelerated content creation. And that's one of the things that we brought a new product to market during COVID to support specifically that. And, and, and we're seeing that as an, an important development that happened just in the last two years. Thank you. Tony? I have a question. Okay. I want to ask Dan House a question. Oh boy, oh boy. Dan, what's Oprah really like? <laughs> Come on, you, we brought you here, you gotta tell us. The record light is still red, I'm not an idiot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and now he leaves the room. Yeah. Yeah. That's Tony for you. Throws a, throws a bomb and then takes off. We, we're, we're, we're understanding of that. That was a wine fueled comment. It was, yes. <laughs> Little Chardonnay, well, that'll happen. Um, any last thoughts before we call it a day? What's, uh, what do you see as far as 3D or VR for the future of life? <laughs> uh, for, 
from my, I'll say from my avid days, this has been tried and stopped and tried and stopped and tried and stopped. <laughs> so I, uh, I don't know where it's going to go, but there was a lot of stuff at NEB this year I saw. Um, so it's still trying. So I'll ask these other professionals who might be deeply involved in it, but we uh, we did uh, we provided engineering support for the 360 activation for the Super Bowl halftime show this year, uh, and so they had what nine Insta Stream cameras out there, and you know I just as a viewer at home I just don't want to work that hard, <laughs> you know I really don't I don't. Uh, I'm, I don't know. I feel like my I, I feel like my grandpa or something when I say I'm right. It's just I don't get it, you know, and, and that's kind of where my mindset is still uh, on some of those things. But uh, I'm sure Randall can give a very more eloquent answer. I can't comment on 3D uh, personally, but we've been doing VR for the last year in our building number two, 40 foot monitor wall, uh, four Venice cameras in 6K, uh, home interactive workouts for uh, a marquee client of ours. And uh, disguise software, Unreal Engine, driving all of it, uh, and we've had a great experience with it over the last uh, year. Because of COVID, they were able to bring people working out from home, bring them into the 40-foot monitor wall, and make it feel like a social interactive experience with the telemetry uh, fed to the cameras and all of it tracking. So it had the feel of of um, a, you're in the room, uh, and it was. Uh, high value uh, uh, production and um, we've, we've learned a lot and I think it has a lot of, of future. It, it's an ideal deployment of that actually. So you I think. You might also look into a thing called Fantagrams, which is a 3D that's designed to be seen flat on the table so you're looking 45 degree angle and the things rise up. Mm. So imagine watching a football game from that perspective. Yeah, so you showed something at the booth. Yeah, vo volumetric capture is going to be something that's very interesting that's coming along. I mean, the film business started in New York City. When they turned into shooting outside, they said, we need somewhere that we don't have to stay inside four months out of the year. <laughs> that's why they came here. Uh, it was all about weather and being able to do that. So it drove what the production is. With volumetric capture, you can do anything in a room this size. It doesn't matter where that is supposed to be or whether it's even real. You know, we can we can generate with Unreal Engine or Unity a environment that's you know, it's an alien planet. It doesn't exist, and it can look like it's perfectly um, perfectly lit and perfectly set for the action that's supposed to happen on it. The Mandalorian happened that way. Yeah, and Dan is not real here. This is this yeah. is not real, Dan. But <laughs> it's AI, Dan. AI, Dan. <laughs> but he's an unreal engineer. Exactly. Um, and Canon has their uh, stereoscopic 180 uh, camera here at their booth today. So there, there's some definitely cool technologies out there, um, and there's there's some other very cool clients out there. Imagine eighteen thousand people eighteen thousand people sitting in a stadium. And you've got video all around you. This is the stuff. This is the stuff that dreams are made of. And guess what? It's it, it's happening. So, um, thanks to to George, Randall, Dan for for joining me today, and thanks for everybody for for joining us on this uh, state of live production. Thank you.